Hey guys, welcome back to my channel where I cover nostalgic, obscure, or otherwise strange content. Today we're throwing it way, way back for a Disney movie that everyone just kind of seems to forget about. Uh, and that movie is The Adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad. Uh, this movie was made in 1949. Uh, it was like the last thing that was really a direct result for Disney of the wartime era. During World War II, Disney decided to switch and put an emphasis on uh, shorts and collections of shorts instead of doing full-length feature film animations. And even though this technically came out after the war ended, the structure of this movie I, I think is really a result of that because um, it's only an hour long, just over actually, and the movie actually consists of two shorter stories that each take up about half the film. Um, and they have nothing to do with each other. This movie was something that I gravitated to as a really young child. Um, we used to be able to borrow VHS tapes at the library. Does anybody else remember doing that? This was a favorite of mine. I would try to take it out every single time I could until my parents eventually just bought me my own copy because they were tired of me asking to go to the library to look for it. I'm also pretty sure that the all the Bing Crosby music in the second half of the movie um, is what started my lifelong love of music by Bing Crosby and just other music of that era, that very like 40s and 50s jazz era music. With all that being said, I'm gonna jump right in uh, real quick before we do though. Uh, this movie is from 1949. There are a couple of things that are of its time. This movie, if you look at it on Disney+, Plus, is actually not one of the movies that they have, like, a um, outdated content warning on, but, you know, I'll just, I'll briefly touch on, on it when we get there, but I just wanted that to be said right off the bat, uh, in case that's something you don't feel like talking about today, so. With that out of the way, uh, let's jump into this movie and see if anybody else but me remembers it. Mr. and Mr. Toad. It does have very catchy music, I'll say that right off the bat. I actually like how they go about kind of justifying why the two stories are put together. We start off in this library, and basically we're going to have one story from literature, from English literature told to us, and then one story from classic American literature told to us. Those stories, of course, being uh, a story from Wind in the Willows and then, you know, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. If you were asked to choose the most fabulous character in English literature, who would it be? The Mr. Toad segment is narrated by Basil Rathbone. I'm probably saying his name wrong. I'm looking him up as we speak because it feels like I always get some piece of information uh, wrong, <laughs> or I misunderstand something in every episode, and I'm trying really hard uh, to get this information correctly. Yeah, he was most famous for playing uh, Sherlock Holmes in a bunch of old Sherlock Holmes movies and radio shows. I actually, there's a few of the movies that he was in, I think, on YouTube right now, so that might be something that I cover in future videos. Anyway, back to what we were watching. Vicky Sharp, Sherlock Holmes, Oliver Twist, perhaps. Oh, he referenced Sherlock Holmes. I would nominate a toad. I never really liked Wind in the Willows as a kid. It's like technically a children's book, but I always found it sad and I don't know why. I always loved uh, Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Maybe I was just a weird kid. Positive mania for pets, and he never counted the cost. So we're told about, you know, Toad. He's a wealthy socialite Toad and he has a couple of friends. And then there was a water rat. A bit stuffy perhaps, but really a fine fellow and uh, a mole. We now get to see Rat and Mole uh, being interrupted while they're just trying to have some tea and peace. Oh, special delivery, Mr. Rat. It's moments like this in this story that confuse me because the animals live in people houses and dress like people. Like that, you know, that's run of the mill for kids' movies. But like, the humans just interact with these animals like without any further questions, like, Thank you, Postman. Like, that's a human-sized door, and the Postman just has no qualms about giving a rat his mail. Not that he should, I'd be very angry for Rat if they didn't want to give him his mail. But it's just like, it's very strange, they never, like, address this, and I've always had questions. You and Mole must come to Toad Hall at once. Yeah, and like, Toad lives in Toad Hall, which is just a giant mansion where one singular Toad lives by himself. Damage, lamppost, 
Orphan Six. So Angus McBadger, the Scottish Badger friend, is trying to sort out Toad's backwards finances. Also, can we appreciate that the other friends' names are Rat, Mole, and Toad, and his name is Angus McBadger. You get your money in due course. He is a very proper gentleman from the Highlands. So the poor man's about to have a heart attack. He has to fend off all of these, you know, tax collectors or bill collectors because Toad owes everybody money. So much got to be done about Todd. You got to find Todd and stop him. So he sends the other two to go track Toad down. He's rampaging about the county in a canary yellow jeep cart. Yeah, like that. We don't say that anymore. So yeah, Toad's running around in this horse-drawn cart with his horse friend Cyril. Are we on our way to Devonshire, to Lancashire, or Worcestershire? Who seems perfectly nice. They're singing a song that's going to be stuck in your head. They're just wrecking everything in their path, just completely murking all this private property. Hello, you fellas! And then they get stopped by his friends. We want to have a talk with you. Oh, a visit! So they start giving him the dad lecture, a rat does, about being more responsible. Becoming a menace to society with such a fast and irresponsible beast. There's no need to be mean to Cyril. Stop it! Let me go! They pull his pants off. He takes off running. It's it's very chaotic. You'll never get me to give this up. But he's like, no, nothing will take me away from this horse-drawn cart. It's a motor car. Motor car? And then he sees a car, and he does not want to be around the horse-drawn cart anymore. <laughs> they get run off the road by these two assholes in this motor car. And he's just like, I want that to be me. I want to be the asshole running people off the road with a motor car. It isn't. He hasn't. It is. And he has. So I guess because Toad is like seen as a danger to himself because of his like bad spending habits, they literally lock him in his own room. Now, of course, playing jailer to one's dearest friend wasn't exactly a pleasant situation. It's very harsh. Uh, and then he climbs out the window and runs off uh, because he's determined to get a car. Even if he had to beg, borrow, or... Well, that is not a good look. Also, I've never paused it to look at any of these, like, other headlines that they managed to put in. Two die in gunfight at doors of palace. Bomb is also thrown near where Bulgarian king is conferring. Disney! <laughs> Good lord, you didn't have to go in so hard like that, Disney. <laughs> Calm down. Counsel for the crown, proceed with the case. So now there's this whole trial scene where all of his friends have to testify on behalf of Toad, because he's being accused of stealing a car. In 1940s, Disney was wild. You knew with a prisoner's mania for motor cars? Oh, we liar. That is all! Thank you! That lawyer is not passing the vibe check either. And then Toad decides to go all Ace Attorney. I almost said Ace Ventura. No, a he goes Ace Attorney, and he's his own attorney, and he's like pleading his own case why he didn't steal this car. You heard Mr. McBadger testify that his allowance is cut off! You don't have to yell. And what is the honest way? Haha, <laughs> I thought you wouldn't know that, Governor. <laughs> ah, Cyril coming in with the burns today. But hadn't gone far, I confess. Something passed like the London Express. So Cyril starts to tell this story in rhyme. I don't know why they did that. Maybe that's part of the book. I haven't actually read the book in a long time. But he's recounting the events of the day that the car was stolen. And we watched while some tough-looking weasels got out of that lovely red car. So I guess they saw a bunch of weasels driving a car up to a bar. Sounds like the start of a really weird joke, but anyway. I never got to ride the ride at Disneyland, because we never had it at Disney World, but isn't wasn't that like Mr. Toad's Wild Ride? Didn't you ride in motor cars? So Mr. Toad walks into this bar. He's like, I gotta buy that car. And he has no money because he's in his pajamas. And then he manages to drop a legally binding contract in the middle of this pub. The weasels gave him the red motor car. <laughs> And he gave the weasels Toad Hall! And so yeah, he, uh, in the contract, agreed to give them Toad Hall, his estate. For a motor car. For a car. He's very bad at making deals. And so then he calls to the stand Mr. Winky, who is the barman 
uh, the bartender, owner of the pub. Just tell the court what actually happened. Who apparently witnessed this whole thing happen. You tried to sell me a stolen motor car. And he sells him out. And so apparently on that one testimony from that one person that no one knows. Toad guilty! Toad is convicted and thrown in prison. Very rough day for him. So now we flash towards Christmas. It is now Christmas. Don't worry, we're not doing any more Christmas movies right now, technically. Poor Toad. Alone with the memories of his wasted life. Toad has been in prison this whole time. It's very sad. Yeah, there's this depressing scene where he's crying and then like missing his friends as he's been wrongly convicted and put in jail. Being as it's Christmas, you're allowed a visitor. And who comes to visit him but Cyril, who walks on his hind legs, which anyway. Christmas gift. A disguise. And he brings him a costume to escape in, which leaves me with other questions, like, how does this plan work? Like, did nobody check up to make sure the prisoner was still in there? Like, after after they snuck him out? Did the guard forget that only one visitor went in and now two are coming out? I've got questions. Oh, good evening, ma'am. Good evening to you, officer! But anyway, Toad's on the run. <laughs> The cops are just shooting at him randomly. He jumps into the river and forgets that he has a ball and chain around his ankle. <laughs> can't toads breathe under water? No, maybe they can't. But like, oh, so they can hold their breath between four and seven hours? That doesn't seem right. But then this says almost all frogs and toads are capable of breathing underwater. I'm very confused. Anyway, he's afraid he's gonna drown, but spoiler alert, he doesn't. Bless poor toad. And may he get time off for good behavior. He interrupts Rat and Mole's uh, Christmas dinner. Apparently they just never get to eat in peace. And then they think the police have come for him and he talks a tough talk, but he's not tough at all. Afraid of the police? The police! He's a frightened little toad. Open up, I say! Judge. But it's Angus, so I don't know how they didn't recognize his voice, but anyway. I've just made a very important discovery. Angus has come to inform them that Mr. Winky and the Weasels, <laughs> it is really weird to say, they're living at Toad Hall with the deed that Mr. Winky lied on the stand about. I've got some more questions. First of all, why did he have to lie? Like, they already have Toad Hall. Like, why? Like, why put Toad in prison? And second of all, how did they not know that someone would figure out that they were living there? Like, they didn't think this plan through and somehow they've got away with it up until Christmas. To prove your innocence, we've got to get that paper away from Winky. And then instead of going to the police and being like, hey, they're actually living at Toad Hall like Toad said they would be because he said he signed a deed, they decide to sneak into the house and risk their own lives to steal the deed back. I'll pop him all! Stop! Stop! Don't do shoot! Toad almost gets them shot because he's a dumbass. Everybody's passed out drunk, which they literally establish in the movie. They are drunk. They've been hitting the bottle. Something that Disney would not do nowadays, but it was a different time. And then Mole gets a hold of the deed, but not without waking up Mr. Winky, who is mad in English con artist. The pipe! It's gone! <laughs> Get him, you bloke! There's a chase scene where they have many dangerous sharp objects thrown at them. Where's Molly? But they all somehow escape. I guess the, the weasels don't know how to open that secret passageway. Well done, Thaddeus. Hip, hip, hooray! And they have the deed, so they have cleared Toad's name. To the new year, and to, to the, the new, new Toad. toad. And they barely have a second to drink to Toad's health before they find out that now... Come! I'll show you the world! He's into airplanes. Travel! Change! Excitement! <laughs> Toad is one of the most unhinged characters. The most fabulous of all will always be, uh, to me at least, the master of Toad Hall. Okay, so that's the end of the first story, Mr. Toad's story. Uh, and now we move on to the Ichabod part of Ichabod and Mr. Toad. But don't forget, over here in the colonies, we've managed to come up with a few of our own. 
This half of the movie is narrated by Bing Crosby. Old Icky, if you recall, was the country schoolmaster, dreamed up by Washington Irving. Who had one of the most distinctive singing and speaking voices of all time. If we could but journey back to that remote period in American history when the city of Manhattan was but a market town. And yes, this next half of the movie goes out to all of my fellow goth kids that love anything related to Halloween. It's a quiet, peaceful place, and yet somehow foreboding. All the best Halloween stories take place in a small New England town. See him striding along. One might well mistake him for some scarecrow eloped from a cornfield. We see um, Ichabod coming into town. Ichabod was the school teacher in Sleepy Hollow. Odd bodkins, gad zooks. Look at that old spook of spooks. None of the characters in this portion of the movie talk, by the way. I don't know if it was just because they really wanted to get mileage out of the fact that they had booked Bing Crosby. Are they shovels or are they feet? Um, but unlike the first part, where like everybody had their own individual voice, uh, Bing Crosby just straight up narrates this one. Ichabod, Ichabod Crane. Singing, talking, it's all him. As usual, there had forgathered at ye old schnooker and schnapp shoppy. Ye old, that is quite a name. Their self-appointed leader, one Brom Bones, was a burly, roistering blade, always ready for a fight. Oh yeah, so here's like the big buff boy <laughs> Brom Bones. You know, as a kid watching this movie, I always thought the takeaway was that Brom was a jerk and that Ichabod was just being picked on for no reason. But as an adult looking back, I almost feel like this situation is like a Jim and Dwight situation where Ichabod pulls a bunch of crap and Brom just kind of tries to call about on his crap. You'll see. Yet he has a certain air. We also have this um, song as Ichabod's walking into town, which is a very Bing Crosby, Bing Crosby song. Mean and lanky, skin and bone, with clothes and scarecrow, with hate to bone. And it's basically just a song where everybody in town body shames Ichabod. And we also learn that he's really superstitious. Ichabod may be quaint. And that he likes food. How do you fit a whole pu Never mind. I'm not gonna overanalyze this cartoon. The townspeople all agree they've never seen anyone like Ichabod, Ichabod Crane. Also, this scene and the opening scene from Beauty and the Beast, same scene, different fonts. <laughs> Tell me I'm wrong. The schoolroom became Ichabod's empire. Yes, yeah, so we quickly learn that Ichabod is kind of an asshole. Never bore in mind the golden maxim, spare the rod and spoil the child. He's very sus, like he's just about to haul off and hit this kid in his class. And the only reason he doesn't is because this kid has a bunch of really great food in his lunchbox. And so he's like, ah, oh, I can scam my way into dinner at this kid's house if I don't kick the shit out of him. Who's the town ladies man? Gets around like nobody can. The other thing about Ichabod is he's a real nice guy when it comes to women. <laughs> this is true in every version, except maybe the the Sleepy Hollow movie with Johnny Depp. Does anybody want to see a video on that? Because I need to cover that at some point. Boom, boom. <laughs> right, so Brahms just kind of playing harmless pranks because this guy's kind of a little bit odd around other people. It was inevitable that such a man as Ichabod would become an object of ridicule to Brom Bones and his gang. Sure, don't help any of the ladies passed out. Eat a big fucking salad. That fateful day when his path was crossed by a woman. And then this character shows up. This is Katrina. This is the character that like Ichabod and Brom are always fighting over as if she's not like her own human being. Once you have met that little coquette, Katrina. And again, as a kid, this scene always made me feel like Katrina was, like, sneaky in some way. You're supposed to feel bad for all the guys, like, tripping over themselves for her. Because they're, like, simping for her, I guess. But Katrina will kiss and run. But hear me out. Katrina's just showing up to the park with her dad and all these guys just won't leave her alone. So like, I don't know that that's really her fault. This feels like sexism. You can do more with Margaret or Helena. What does that mean? <laughs> Bing. 
but Katrina will kiss and run. What are you implying <laughs> in this children's movie? Like Ichabod's on a date with somebody else and he just doesn't care. Now there was no doubt the fair Katrina was the richest prize in the countryside. He's like not even doing his job anymore. He's like, who needs to teach these kids? Who can resist your grace, your charm? And who can resist your father's farm? They also just straight up go ahead and tell us that Ichabod's just not a good guy. He's just a gold digger. Well, the old goat can't take it with him. And when he cuts out, that's what I cut in. Charming. Every portal to Katrina's heart was jealously guarded by a host of rustic admirers. And then we have this scene where Brom and Ichabod, again, fight over Katrina like she's not a person. Very weird behavior, but also... what? <laughs> it's time to carry the issue to open warfare. Very strange behavior. <laughs> Yeah, so the only reason Brom doesn't rock his shit is because he wants to pretend like he's not ready to just fly off the handle in a violent rage in front of Katrina. And Katrina just finds all of this entertaining, so she invites both of them to her dad's Hello. Halloween ball. Katrina again chose to stir the embers of the smoldering rivalry. Just for kicks, just like, yeah, let's see what happens with this. There wasn't a lot going on entertainment-wise in ye old times. What is this strange power you have over women? He rides off on his horse, which I'm pretty sure is the same model as Cyril from the other movie, or from the other story. They were still getting hit hard with like, you know, the financial hurdles of the war era, so we're gonna cut them some slack. So Ichabod's dancing with Katrina, Brom doesn't like it, so he decides to further break the heart of this poor lady who already got like screwed over on her date with Ichabod to like switch her off with Ichabod. <laughs> scene goes on for quite a quite a long time. So Brom doesn't like that Ichabod's popular now, but he knows that Ichabod's very superstitious, so he's like, I know how I'll get him. I'll tell him a scary story. Just gather around and I'll elucidate on what goes on outside when it gets late. So he starts telling this ghost story. That's another like classic Bing Crosby song. I went to have a midnight jamboree. They break it up with English glee. He's obviously telling him the story about the headless horseman. Ghosts are bad, but the one that's cursed is the headless horseman. He's the worst. Headless horseman. I didn't know I I don't know why I said it weird. Headless horseman. That's why he's a bird on Halloween night. What is it in DuckTales? The headless man horse? Manny. Black or white or even. The headless horseman needs a head. Oh, there's another. We don't say that either anymore. That song came up on a Halloween playlist that I was listening to uh, this past autumn, and I was like grooving out, and then I stopped and listened, and I was like, oh no, we don't, we don't say that. Once you cross that bridge, my friend. <laughs> probably all know, you know, he tells him, you know, oh, the headless horseman will get you and take your head, but if you cross the bridge in time, uh, then he can't cross that bridge and you'll be safe. And then Ichabod does like a last dab with red pepper flakes on an egg and he's all scared. It was the very witching hour of night that Ichabod pursued his travel homeward. And so now we see him riding home alone, which is pretty terrifying. Always creeped me out. <laughs> as a kid. I'm horribly afraid of the dark, so I would be scared to do something like this even now. Yeah, but he's freaked out. He's imagining things. And then who shows up but the Headless Horseman? And so there's this scene that really terrified me as a kid where he's chasing Ichabod around trying to decapitate him. Once you cross that bridge, my friends, the ghost is through. His power ends. So he's desperately trying to get to the bridge. Yeah! And he makes it across! Yay! And then he throws a flaming pumpkin at him. So I will rescind my yay. Next morning, Ichabod's hat was found. And close beside it, a shattered pumpkin. But is his horse okay? We never find out if his horse is okay. But there was no trace of the schoolmaster. 
But what about the horse? It was shortly thereafter that Brom Bones led the fair Katrina to the altar. So yeah, Brom and Katrina got married. Now rumors persisted that Ichabod was still alive, married to a wealthy widow in a distant county. And Bing Crosby's like, maybe he's still alive. Maybe it was all just an urban legend. Good Dutch settlers refused to believe such nonsense. He goes all Jonathan Frakes on us. He's like, it could have been any of these things that could have happened. Well, they knew the schoolmaster had been spirited away by the headless horseman. But, like, real talk, what do we think happened? Like, do we think that the story is actually about the Headless Horseman killing Ichabod, or was it Brom just trying to, like, scare the shit out of him? You can't reason with a Headless man. Like, how do you guys interpret Sleepy Hollow? Man, I'm getting out of here. And that's the end. <laughs> that's the end of that movie. Uh, do you guys remember slash know slash like this movie. This is something that I have very, very fond memories of. There's a lot of nostalgic memories around this for me, uh, and I will still put it on sometimes as like background noise when I'm working. I oftentimes put on old, you know, Disney movies or cartoons when I'm editing and stuff, but I want to know, like, do does anybody else, like, remember this? Like, what do you guys think about this movie? It's very old and it's very of its own time, but it's also got a lot of, like, charm. So I've been wanting to talk about this on the channel for a really long time because that's what I do. I talk about old weird stuff and this is old and weird. I definitely think that Disney should have like the outdated content warning on this like they have on some other movies like the Aristocats and other movies like that that I'm also like fond of but there are definitely some moments where I'm just like oh we don't we don't say that anymore Disney. <laughs> Maybe just give like a little warning. But that's it for this video. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching, liking, commenting, subscribing, sharing, everything you do to support this channel means the world to me. If you're new here and you're a fan of nonsense, maybe consider sticking around because I post nonsense all the time. And remember, my name is Avery. I'm a YouTuber if you say so, because thanks to you guys, this is technically a YouTube channel. Bye!